hear without further ado, Robert Reich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like a flock of ge geese. <laughs> uh, as, you can, as you can see, as you can see, the recession wore me down. Took a lot out of me, but we are in a recovery. <laughs> Not much of a recovery. Uh, John Burton, Steve Silverstein, thank you so much for inviting me tonight. California Democrats, California Democrats, California Democrats, the best, most powerful, most dedicated Democrats across this country, California Democrats. I want to tell you what is really happening with the American economy. You know, California is always a larger version, a bigger version of what happens in America, and the California economy is no different. So what I'm going to tell you about what's happening and what has happened to the American economy is writ large in California. And what we have to do about what has happened to and is what, what is happening in the American economy is also very much what we, since I am now a resident of this wonderful state, must do here in California. I'm going to try to connect the dots. In fact, there are five dots that I want to connect tonight. And they are dots that ought to be connected for every American because people need to understand the truth. Here comes dot number one. Over the past three and a half decades, wages for the typical working American, if you adjust for inflation, have gone nowhere. They are not any larger. They are not any more. In fact, if you are working today, compared to somebody who is working 35 years before, if you adjust again, energy and food prices, everything else, you are actually earning less than you were earning 35 years ago. The typical American, the median wage, the median wage is below what it was then. Median. Now, Note what I said, median wage. That's not average. Don't be confused about average and median. The basketball player Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six feet. <laughs> you see, you get my point? Median is right smack in the middle, equal number above, equal number below. When you talk about the averages, everything goes up because the people at the top are doing so well. So look at the median wage, it's been flat. Even though, even though over the last 33 years, the American economy has doubled in size. Now, when wages started to flatten out or decline for most Americans, a lot of Americans, and we're talking about the late 1970s when this all began, a lot of Americans got scared. Middle class Americans, working class Americans became scared, as you would become scared if your wages, where you had been for three decades, those wages have been going up, now they start leveling out or declining, you start getting a little scared. And so when somebody comes along, like Howard Jarvis, and says, 
We're going to cut your taxes. We're going to cut your property taxes. Well, the tax revolts that rolled across America beginning in the late 1970s have a lot to do with the fact that average working people's wages stopped growing and, in fact, started to declining. People got worried. People got worried. And demagogues came out and they said, you got to pay fewer taxes, and they bit. So that is dot number one. Median wages flat, the economy, the economy doubling in size. What's dot number two? Dot number two that connects to dot number one, where did all the money go? Remember, the economy now is twice as large as it was over 30 years ago. Median wage, flat, if not declining. Where did the money go? It went to the top. Three decades ago, the richest 1% of Americans took home 9% of total income. I'm going to say that again because when you start talking about numbers and the economy over a nice dinner, people start, well, their eyes start glazing over, but I'm going to say it again because this is important. Three decades ago, the richest 1% of Americans took home 9% of the total income of the country. Well, guess what? Income became concentrated more and more and more at the top until by 2007, the top 1% took home 23.5% of total income in this country. And that's just income. We're not talking about wealth. Wealth is even more concentrated than income. Now, a lot of that has to do with globalization. A lot of that has to do with the decline of unions and the corporations beating up unions. A lot of that has to do with new technologies. We can talk about reasons, but the fact of the matter is that this country did not do enough. Did not do enough. And I can say, as Labor Secretary under Bill Clinton's administration, I don't feel we did enough to stem that tide and reverse that trend. And now, dot number three. Dot number three is that with all that income and wealth going to the top, you know what else went to the top? Political power. Because with income and wealth going to the top, political power also goes to the top. And that means that people at the top, they're not necessarily bad people. I'm not a class warrior. I'm a class worrier. You see, there's a difference between class warrior and class worrier. It's one letter, but it's big letter. I'm a class warrior. People at the top, they're not bad people, but people at the top use their political power directly or indirectly through corporations, and they got their tax rates lowered. You think that's good? You're applauding that? <laughs> well, no, I'll tell you, I'll give you something to applaud in just a minute, but you know what happens when your taxes lower. Uh, uh, people don't realize this. Uh, before 1981, the top marginal income tax on the top incomes in the United States were never below 70%. Under Dwight D. Eisenhower, who nobody, nobody, Senator Sanders, you remember this, I guess, I don't know that you were there, but I remember Dwight Eisenhower, and nobody accused Dwight David Eisenhower of being a socialist, did they? No, but the marginal tax rates on the top in the Eisenhower administration were 91%. And the effective rates, even if you got all the deductions and all the tax credits, the effective rates were still up there, way over 55, 60%. The rich paid their fair share. But you see, with dot number three, with political power, with the ability to reduce taxes, not only income taxes, but also, even more importantly, at the top reaches of America, capital gains taxes, estate taxes, inheritance taxes, that is, estate taxes, and on and on and on. All the taxes that affect people who are at the very top, they got lower and lower and lower and lower rates. If we went back 
in the national government to the tax rates that we had 30 years ago, that would pull in this year alone $350 billion more from the top 1% of Americans. Do you know what that would do, $350 billion? A lot. Well, let me do go now go on to dot number four, because you know what happened, and this is the story. I'm just giving it to you absolutely straight. This is the unadorned direct story. Dot number one, again, flat wages. Dot number two, the economy growing, all the benefits going to the top. Dot number three, power going to the top and taxes going down. Dot number four, obviously, because you've suffered it here in California, and the federal government has seen it dramatically. If you don't have a middle class that any longer is capable of paying any more taxes because their incomes are flat or dropping, and all the income's going to the top and they have managed to reduce their taxes, then what happens to your budgets, your public budgets, your state budgets, your federal budgets? You don't have enough money to do the things that you have to do in a decent, civilized society. And that means budget cuts. And that means you're cutting some of the most important things you could possibly do as a nation or as a state. Education, health care, our care for the less fortunate, our care for our children. We're cutting because there is not enough money. And where is the money? The money is mostly at the top. And what happens then? People lose their confidence in government. They stop believing. They start believing government can't deliver. It's not going to work. I cannot trust government because government is not there for me. Government is not there for you. Why isn't government there for you? Because government can't afford to be there for you because people are not particularly the most fortunate members of our society are not there for you. Which brings us to the final dot. Dot number five. What has been created is somehow this notion in this country, in California and around the land, that we are no longer a rich nation, that we are a poor nation now. And we have to, therefore, according to this idea, we have got to not only pull in our belts, but we've got to compete with other working Americans, with the scraps we have. In other words, what has happened in dot number five, and a lot of Republicans have done this, and some wealthy people and some big corporations have done it, and some have done it intentionally, and some have done it indirectly, and maybe unintentionally, but what has happened, dot number five, this feeling that the only way we can prosper is if another working person or some other working people do not prosper. Union people versus non-union. Public employees versus non-public employees. Immigrants versus native-born. The technique is called divide and conquer. And it is based on, my friends, a big lie. The big lie is that we are no longer a rich nation. The big lie is that public employees are somehow responsible for this economy. The big lie is that unions are somehow responsible for a bad economy. The big lie is that government deficits are somehow responsible for this bad economy. None of that is true. What is true is that this economy is having a very hard time coming out of the gravitational pull of the Great Recession. In fact, we learned yesterday that economic growth in the first quarter of 2011, annualized economic growth was 1.8%. 1.8%. That is 
so slow. That is a snail's pace. That is molasses. That is not growth. Some people on Wall Street think inflation is the biggest danger ahead. No, no. The biggest economic danger is going back into recession. The biggest economic danger is a double dip. And why are we in that danger? Why is the economy growing so slowly? Why, in fact, did we go into the Great Recession to begin with? I'll tell you why. Because if the middle class and the working class of America, they, if they don't have enough money in their pockets to turn around and buy what needs to be bought in order to keep the economy going, in order to keep people in jobs, well, then you don't have an economy that is capable of growing. Widening inequality with more and more of the benefits of this economy and the entire benefits of economic growth going to a small sliver at the top makes it almost impossible for the economy to grow, let alone there to be enough tax revenues so that we can invest in the things that we must invest in for each other and for the future, like health and like education and like the common welfare and protecting our young and our most vulnerable. Now, here comes the good news. Have I depressed you enough? Well, here's the good news. The good news is this, and it's particularly good news in this wonderful state of California. There is no state in the union that has the human resources, the talent, the beauty, the climate, the innovation of the state of California. There is no state in America that has the diversity of California. There's no state in the union that keeps on coming up with new ideas, new ideas about controlling environmental degradation, new ideas about new products and services, new ideas about what human beings can do to improve the lot of mankind and humankind than the state of California. There's no place else where it happens. Silicon Valley, entertainment, technology, even venture capital. Nowhere else we are in the lead. So why is there such a great gulf and gap between the leading place that we have in the world as the state of California and indeed as America continually and the paltry stinginess of the way we are acting toward one another in terms of what we are willing to do to invest in the common good. Most people around this country and in California do not know how wealthy America is. Most people around the country do not know that our actual gross domestic product, the entire economy, is now larger and higher and bigger than it was before the Great Recession. Most people around this country are still scared, and I understand why they are scared. Now, I was in Washington for a number of years, and I can tell you something. There are some valiant and courageous people like Bernie Sanders in Washington. but there are not enough of them. Nothing good happens in Washington. And indeed, nothing good happens in government unless people are mobilized and organized and energized at the grassroots level. Nothing good happens until and unless we have a progressive movement in this country that will push and prod and demand that good things happen. (laughs) 
You in this room, you in this room are the keystone, the cornerstone, the foundation of that progressive movement. What you do, what you have done, what you will do in the future is so critical to the future. Now I know, because I know many of you, some of you have expressed to me quiet reservations and some discouragement. Some of you feel that politically and economically things are bad. Some of you worry that maybe tomorrow and next month and next year, given budget crises and given what Washington is doing and given what the Republicans are up to, things may not get better. I have news for you and I have encouraging words for you. You are on the right side. You are on the side of truth. You are on the side of social justice. And in this country, eventually, that side always wins. But we have to get the truth out. I think President Obama is the best president we have had for years. I am so proud of him. My only... And every time, by the way, every time I see him, and I've had the pleasure and the privilege of seeing him a number of times, every time I have seen him in person, I am so overcome by the fact not only of his presence and his temperament and his serenity and his coolness and his intelligence, but I'm overwhelmed by the fact we have a black president in the White House. But if I had, if I have just one small constructive criticism, just a small constructive criticism, it's that he needs to be tougher with the Republicans. <laughs> now it is not easy in Washington Washington is like drinking water through a fire hose 24 hours a day. It is hard when you are in the White House. It is hard when you're trying to do anything at Washington. But I urge all of you to give our president and our Democrats in Washington the courage of their conviction. I want you to raise hell. I want you to tell everybody in Washington what you want and what you need. You know, California is sending more money every year to Washington than it gets back from Washington. Did you know that? California needs some assistance from Washington and ought to get it. California is eating its seed corn right now, and that is dangerous not only for California, but it's dangerous for the country because California is the eighth largest economy in the world. Now one final point, a point of encouragement and a point to rally around. That is, we have many ideas here. I've talked to some of you about a state bank here in California. I think it's a good idea. I've talked to some of you about some of the ideas for regulating executive pay so that instead of executives having pay that's 300 times the average worker, let's bring it down. Let's have a tax system that actually rewards companies for producing more equitable pay. Let's have California is leading the way with regard to environmental regulation. Let's be even tougher on the oil companies. And let's make sure that the oil companies pay an extraction fee for what they are doing in California. Now I know there are many, many other ideas. I know all of this is politically difficult, but we can do it. We can do it because, again, not only do we have truth and social justice on our side, but we have 
the future on our side. We have the future. Who are the Democrats in America? They are young people, and they are people of color, they are Latinos, they are Hispanics. That is our future. They are Democrats. They believe in the values of Democrats, and that is the best news of all. The future is on our side. Thank you all. Thank you.